My contribution is concerned with the deconstruction of various understandings of participation in IDOCs that have dealt with the topic of migration in recent years. I would like to derive from their observations the thesis that one of the preconditions for empowerment is the organization of complexity, an idea that is implicit above all in the cultural, theoretical, philosophical definitions of participation that have received little attention so far. In the following, I will briefly explain what I mean by IDOX, then take a more nuanced look at the concept of participation and bring into play a hitherto little noticed cultural theoretical conception of participation, which is about dividuation, that ultimately calls for relational complexity. I will briefly introduce this notion and then look at three different models of participation in post-migrant narratives, each of which organizes relational complexity in a different way. By IDOCs, I mean web documentaries as well as open space documentaries organized via the internet, web-based VR or AR applications, 360-degree projects or social media projects. IDOCs are said to have a number of special characteristics. They are interactive, networked, non-linear, polyphonic and participatory. Because of their participatory characters, they are seen as having an empowering effect on the stakeholders involved, and media participation is even equitated with social and political participation. But does this equitation really work? Or is it not rather necessary to distinguish between different forms of participation, or even to formulate conditions or intermediate steps in order for the equitation to work? Participation seems to be a polysemious term that can take on very different meanings depending on the context. Collaboration, co-creation, co-authorship, interactivity, which often becomes just interpassivity, participation, sharing or involvement, to name but a few. Here I would like to instigate another dimension of participation which is addressed in different approaches of cultural theories, for example by Jacques Rancière or more recently by Michaela Ott. She takes up the concept of dividuation introduced by Gilles Deleuze and Marilyn Strasserne and expanded with composite cultural theories by Edouard Clisson. The aim is to reflect on the media and cultural conditioning of one's own thinking and to enable new ways of thinking, new narratives and new patterns of action through irritation and recomposition. Dividuation here means above all the fluid participation of individuals in a cultural discourse and consequently the constitution of a composite cultural self-image, based on this as self-determined as possible, which consciously detached itself from old dependencies. In post-migrant narratives, we expect furthermore a change of the perspective that no longer sees migration only as a problem or judges migrant only in terms of their usefulness or ability to integrate into the majority society. But of how they can participate culturally, socially, and not least, politically. This includes, as Avril Yildiz and Naika Furutan pointed out, also a multi-layered, polyphonic, medio self-reflexive, and even an ambivalent and also antagonistic constitution of knowledge. But strictly speaking, there is also something else at stake here. In the spirit of Jacques Rancière, aesthetically resistant forms are developed that deny the fewer any form of immersive, sensitive, conventional or easily consumable perception. The concrete artistic solution can take various forms, but they have all a form of complexity in common. The media projects should not only deal with the topic of migration, but also reflect on how media deal with this topic. Because this can only be developed in relation to other media, I call these a relational form of complexity. Relational forms of complexity in the context of narratives about migration always starts with the common cliched image of refugees as they are known from the mass media. For example, refugees in crowded rickety boats on the coast of the European Union, refugees outside the border fences, refugees crowding railway station, refugees in overcrowded, improvised camps on the Greek islands with inhumane, hygiene conditions. In short, migrants are presented here as people in need for help. IDOCs are supposed to produce a difference to this established views on migration by interactivity and especially participation. But does this really help to overcome these stereotypes? 
A documentary like Clouds Over Zetra, for example, gives the viewers the possibility to have a 360-degree view inside a refugee camp. The narrative is personalized by the perspective of the 12-year-old girl Zetra, who fled Syria with her family and gives insight into everyday life in a refugee camp in Jordan. In fact, the VR application creates a claustrophobic impression that reinforces the feeling of being trapped despite the freedom of movement within the camp. By concentrating on the girl's perspective, additional empathy is generated. The fugitives appear in the position of people in need of help, whose plight is stereotyped. The user's opportunities for participation in such projects are limited and do not go beyond the option of interactivity with the medium by clicking a donation button. Such web documentaries promote charity with their narratives, but hardly gives rise to deeper consideration of solidarity. The opportunities for migrants to participate in shaping the media are of little use if migrants orient themselves to the image of the majority society and present themselves in the way they think they want to be seen. For post-migrant narratives, which explicitly try to break these stereotypes, complexity is a prerequisite for being able to deal with ambivalence, ambiguities and antagonism in negotiation processes. Media should offer the possibility to convey the complexity of knowledge and perspectives so that the basis for recognition and negotiation is created in the first place. In the following, I would like to sketch three examples which use different methods in the construction of complexity. I will start with the project Let's Stay, which was realized in Berlin in 2017 and supported by public funds. Let's Stay is a YouTube channel with an associate website, which was developed by and with refugees and aimed to present migrants as media professionals in Berlin. It takes an immediate, direct approach to the participation of migrants, which can be seen in two different areas. On the one hand, the migrants are presented in front of the camera as media professionals, i.e. as actively acting subjects, and on the other hand, the project team itself is partly made up of migrants who are given the chance to improve their professional skills and make themselves known through the project. In the total of seven episodes, migrants are not shown in the position of people in need of help, but as independent subjects who not only try to take their lives into their own hands, but also as media makers have a say in how their own story is told. A good example is perhaps the last of the seven episodes. From off-screen, the setting is briefly explained. In der Waldemarstraße in Kreuzberg 36 in Berlin treffen wir uns heute mit Bino Bianski, Bia Kuleka. Binos Heimatland ist Uganda. 2010 kam er als Flüchtling nach Deutschland. 2013 war er im Protestcamp am Oranienplatz in Kreuzberg aktiv. Seitdem engagiert er sich im Refugee Movement. Sein Medium ist das Radio. 2016 startete er sein Radioprogramm Wir Born Free Empowerment Radio. Zu empfangen auf 88.4 MHz in Berlin und 90.7 MHz in Potsdam. Für uns kam er auch vor die Kamera. Viel Spaß! Bino, first of all, tell us, when did you come to Germany and hmm. how? Yeah, that's a very big thing, and, uh, but uh, I will go short. Yes, I came here by plane and I landed uh, directly here in Berlin at Tegel Airport and uh, yeah, right from Uganda. Of course, the, this uh, destination, but uh, yeah, I came by plane, yeah. And when and how did you get engaged with the refugees movement? Uh, my uh, arrival here, arrival, determined my uh, involvement in the refugee struggle because uh, when I arrived, the only way to stay in Germany, I had to seek asylum. That's what they told me. I tried to talk to some people who were close to me and uh, they said, but uh, no one knows you here. So maybe you were seeking asylum. I, I, even before I told them I want asylum, someone told me, are you a refugee? Are you seeking? <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> so presenter in this episode is Semi Ula, a theater maker from Pakistan who is trying out a new medium here. 
The protagonists become co-creators of a narrative in which they show that they are successful media makers. In this regard, the projects contribute to their self-empowerment. Web projects, such as Let's Stay, do not address a preformed mass audience as do mainstream television programs. Rather, they speak to a limited circle of users. The videos of Let's Stay have a reach of between 200 and 500 users, which is very small. We could define a rule here. The more opportunities the migrants have to participate in the design of the project or are empowered by it, the lower its reach. But even if projects like Let's Stay do only achieve a local impact, the significance lies in a local space of action in which migrants create new professional opportunities and possibilities of medial expression for themselves. The web documentary Bruderland, released in 2020, deals with migrants who came to the GDR as political refugees or as students or to earn foreign currency for their respective countries as so-called contract workers. This practice had unpleasant consequences for the migrants concerned because they were treated almost like forced laborers. In the GDR, they were barracked and had hardly any say in the matter, and the sending states brutally exploited them and deprived them of their wages. The web documentary consists of different chapters which follow the path of the migrants, at biographical informations or historical background informations and present short interviews with the migrants. For example, one of these interviews is with Mai Fuang Kolot, followed by more information about her life, including photos of her arrival in Rostock in 1982, where she started as a contract worker, i.e. as a cook. Today, as is explained, she works as a coach, intercultural consultant and actress at the Maxim Gorky Theatre and the Berliner Schaubühne and is one of the initiators of the Bruderland project. The protagonists are shown in a neutral, but so roughly composed, even designed environment, whose style of furnished correspondence more to an established middle class or educated bourgeois background, for example, Alemahie Yehu Gebisa, who holds a professorship at the University of Kiel. The high quality, well-lit shots composed with sufficient depth of field and blurred background correspondent to the state of the art of interviews shot with experts and the protagonists appear in serious closing. Even if the interviews with the migrants refer to their memories of the past, i.e. to the difficult living and working conditions in the former GDR, the production ultimately follows the dramaturgy of a success story. All of them have succeeded in staying or returning to Germany and making a career here. The self-portrayal of the migrants play with the difference between the present of the project and the past of the remembered events. Here memory not only serves to initiate a discourse, but also constructs a kind of habitus alongside the superficial narratives in the interviews which change the meaning of the narrative. It is always a representation from the perspective of Zeus who have learned to cope with the problems of the past, in which they were only tolerated as second-class people, exploited and subjected to repression and to find their place in German society. This creates an encouraging, empowering narrative, as it can also serve as a role model for other migrants. The participation of migrants in Bruderland does not take place directly, but is filtered and processed through editorial work. In this process, the participation of migrants is not about illustrating the perspective of the editorial team, but about the editorial team bringing the migrants' perspective to light and developing a narrative that empowers the migrants. This is especially successful when they are not presented as victims in need of help, but as self-empowered actors who actively tackle problems and develop solutions themselves. A completely different dimension of complexity is constructed by the Limbo project, which is based on the artistic alienation of conventional perspectives on asylum seekers. Limbo is part of a campaign of the English daily newspaper The Guardian, which wanted to draw the attention of a broader public to the fate of asylum seekers. Limbo addresses the situation of refugees who applied for asylum in the UK 
and are now waiting for the decision of the authorities. Between April 2016 and March 2017, 36,846 people applied for asylum. At that time, the number of those still waiting for a decision from previous cases was nearly 31,500. While asylum seekers wait for their home office hearing and subsequent decision, they live on a five pound a day and cannot work or choose where to live. While the home office aims to make an initial decision within six months, many wait longer. Despite access to services from refugee support organizations, asylum seekers are mostly unable to travel, work or learn English. The experimental documentary Limbo gives the audience a glimpse of the situation and the emotional state of those waiting. It is based on interviews with asylum seekers from 12 countries as well as lawyers specialized in immigration. The refugees talk about their arrival in an unfamiliar city, the acute worry about relatives left behind, the problem of not being allowed to work and the fear of the interviews with the Ministry of Interior, which will decide on their application. They talking about the often slow and painful process of applying and then waiting to be reunited with their families. Limbo is just under nine minutes long and was elaboratedly produced using a new 360 degree technique. What is special here is above all the artistic alienation of the presentation. Semi-transparent objects and figures in a black and white depiction abstract from the realism and the image at, at the same time shows the perception of the living environment of migrants waiting for asylum. The many voice statements are excerpts of reports on the experiences of asylum seekers, which, however, are not presented from the direct perspective of the asylum seekers as this would appear too cliched. Instead, the presentation is organized artistically condensed with an visual alienation effect, i.e. a verfremdungseffect, which at the same time arouses the interest of the audience through the new technological representation. They, like you, are in limbo. This is your room. You'll spend a lot of time here since you're not allowed to work. You feel like you're a prisoner. Finally, I would like to come back to the question how the construction of complexity can actually lead to the empowerment of migrants in post-migrant narratives of IDOX. Without undoing the significant differences of the three mentioned very diverse projects, the organization of relational complexity is a unifying aspect of all of them. Even each example stands for different forms of construction of complexity. In that state, different people have their say, some of whom contradict each other and do not correlate with the cliched image of migrants held by the wider public. The polyphony as well as the antagonist communication lead to a low reach of the project but directly strengthens the actors involved through the development of professional skills and by building a community. Bruderland, on the other hand, is primarily about breaking down the widest public image of migrants as people in need of help and showing them as empowered actors who can manage their own affairs and make a valuable contribution to society. The relatively wide range of the project shows that also a rather complex project can be successful. Limbo, finally, too is also a project that has been relatively wide disseminated to the public through the Guardian's campaign. Through artistic alienations, complexity is achieved here primarily by challenging the audience conventions of representations and perceptions. Thank you for your attention.